Morning, everyone, and welcome to this morning's uh, GoFly Master webinar. To start us off, I'd like to introduce Gwen Leiter, CEO and founder of GoFly. Gwen? Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's master lecture with Dr. Kenneth Rosen. As you all know, GoFly's grand sponsor is Boeing, and we are joined as well by several organizational partners worldwide, and we are so pleased to have uh, all of these organizations support us and GoFly and the innovation that we are all seeking to achieve together. So today we are delighted to welcome Dr. Kenneth Rosen. Dr. Rosen has over 55 years of experience in the aerospace, propulsion, turbo machinery, manufacturing, and systems engineering community. He is a member of the National Academy of Engineering and is a fellow of, AI, of the AIAA, AHS, ASME, and the Royal Aero Society. In addition, Dr. Rosen has served as VP of Research and Engineering at Sikorsky Aircraft, as Corporate President of Concepts of NREC, at, as Chairman of the Board of the Rotocraft Industry Technology Association, as chairman of the UTC Engineering Coordination Steering Committee, as well as chairman of the AIA Rotocraft Advisory Group. And he is also a member of NASA's Aeronautics and Space Transportation Technology Advisory Committee. He is the recipient of both the AHS Clement Award and the Nikolsky Lectureship. Dr. Rosen is currently an active member of the Board of Army Services and the NRC Assessment Panel on Air and Ground Vehicle Technology for the ARL. And he holds five US patents and has written numerous papers in the fields of helicopter design, tilt rotor optimization, product development, propulsion, aerothermodynamics, icing, and systems engineering. And so without further ado, we are so very pleased to be able to welcome Dr. Kenneth Rosen for GoFly's Master Lecture. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Rosen. Thank you, Gwen. <clears throat> Let me just start out by saying how privileged I am to be a part of this superb GoFly effort. I think it's a wonderful effort, and I'm really honored to be part of the team. I want to start out by talking a little bit about the score. Uh, everybody on this, on this call is interested in that, so it's a good place to begin. Um, some of these charts are taken from some of the GoFly information that you can find online but they set the stage for what I'm about to talk about uh, later. Um, first of all, what's important? Your final score is gonna depend upon uh, a size parameter, a noise parameter, and a speed parameter. The rules are very clear. You've gotta get your size down to less than eight and a half feet. You've got to get the acoustics down to less than 87 dBA and you've got to achieve a speed over the range, very clearly defined, at over 30 knots average. Um, I think it's important to take a look at the takeoff and landing envelope. Uh, a 30 foot diameter versus 12 foot uh, height, you can think of it as like a cylinder that you've got to take off and climb and basically even come back into. And you've got to carry out a very prescribed speed run of six laps around the one nautical mile course. And when you're done doing that, you've got to loiter in such a way that your endurance is greater than 20 minutes. Let's talk about safety for a minute. Safety is preeminent in our go fly mind here. The intent, and we can't ever forget it, is to develop technologies that can be rated for people to fly in the future. And this is really important that everything be human rateable. Very, very important. And we've got to avoid single point failures, certainly outside of the primary structure. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about a comment that was recently made by Chris Van Buten. 
Many of you know Chris. Uh, in fact, he's going to be a master as well. Um, he's Sikorsky's VP of Innovations, and he's actually one of my protégés, and I'm very proud of him. And what he said at the recent uh, Transformative Vertical Flight Workshop just this month in, in, in January is quite cogent for what we're going to be talking about. The Sikorsky S-92, which, by the way, will eventually uh, fly the President of the United States, is targeted at lowering the fatal accident rate to about 1 million uh, flight hours. Actually, it does a little bit better than that. And that's an exceptional achievement for VTOL. However, it's simply not going to be good enough as we enter this brave new world of what I call com com commuter pilots, uh, a world that we're aiming to enter in, uh, in, in, in work like uh, what is represented here by the GoFly uh, activity. Um, so we've got to do better than that. And what does that mean? It means to really succeed with these kinds of devices, we've got to be absolutely focused on safety. In fact, Chris said that he thought we needed to do 10 times better than the numbers of the S92, which are arguably astounding for VTOL. Um, I want to uh, comment on the rules a little bit. There were some places that I had to read two or three times just to get my head straight. The 20 mile range is basically an objective. The 20 minute flight without uh, reserve, excuse me, uh, uh, and you have to fly reserve beyond, have to have enough fuel for a 10 minute reserve beyond that is really the requirement. The go fly scoring evaluation is explicitly called out in the rules. So read the rules five and 10 times and read them again. You've got to get greater than 20 minutes without reserve fuel. And this reserve fuel is going to be very important later in my lecture. Uh, the eight and a half si uh, a foot size uh, limit, extremely important. Um, the vehicle has to be refuelable, but you can't refuel in the middle of, uh, in the middle of the flight. And what I really read several times was the way the GoFly team calculates fuel remaining. They simply take your fuel consumed and they divide it by two, and that's your goal. You've got to have more fuel than what you consumed over the mission divided by two. So implicitly, if you had enough fuel to fly 20 minutes and you divided by two, you'd got 10 minutes. Now, the, the GoFly people make no explicit commercial cost requirement. They are very strict about safety. The last bullets are kind of really important. They don't really call out IGE or HOGI uh, uh, time limits. Um, they don't uh, talk about any times for the touch and go. And in fact, up until recently, uh, and maybe even today, they haven't actually told us what the altitude density of the area is. Now, I would counsel you to stay very tight with the team on that and keep looking on the sites to see whether or not they make any changes in density altitude. This is very important and certainly will be extremely important if you're, you're going to use a Brayton cycle, let's say gas turbine or a IC, uh, ignition com uh, combustion engine or pressure com uh, 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 combustion engine like a diesel. Uh, very altitude sensitive. Um, and the last bullet's interesting. There's no starting limitations. In, in fact, I didn't see anything that precluded starting it outside the aircraft. Um, what's also interesting is that the rotor propulsor rotational speed variations are not precluded. Now that means you can take full advantage of, of that uh, and change the RPM, let's say you had a tilting device or something of that sort, um, you could slow the rotor up perhaps to get it a bit more efficient at, at the higher speed condition. Or you could slow it up possibly for your acoustic run. These are things to be thinking about. Now, the speed calculation requires a moment here. The speed is calculated by taking simply taking six nautical miles and dividing by the time to complete the six laps around these two pylons, which are spaced a half a nautical mile apart. Now, 
how you fly this, this mission makes a huge difference in, in really what your equivalent speed is. Now, if you were uh, basically unbelievable you were you, uh, and violated the laws of physics, you could go back and forth between these laps. You'd accomplish it in one nautical mile. And if you were operating at approximately 60 knots all the time, it would take you six minutes. You'd have an equivalent speed of 60 knots. That's impossible. So you might say, well, let me leave a little bit more distance. You fly a circular course of two nautical miles. Well, that's not too good because you end up with a 30 knot equivalent speed. I won't read them all, but let me go down to the bottom, uh, five and six options. If you fly elliptical courses, and I left a little room around the edge of the pylon, um, a three to one ellipse gives you a speed of 47.2, and a five to one ellipse gives you a, an equivalent speed of 56.6 knots. In other words, all this time you're flying at, truly flying at 60 knots, but the way your speed is calculated uh, makes a, a, a huge difference in the result. Some technologies are really have emerged in the last 15 years that you ought to think about. And if you're not, you darn well ought to, because this is an extraordinarily challenging prize to win. Uh, you'll see that later when I give you some examples. Um, obviously, composites of some sort, fly-by-wire of some sort, um, um, whether or not it's dual or single would have to be thought about. Uh, you must have a high power to weight ratio engine with excellent fuel consumption. Don't invent a new engine. Please don't invent a new engine. It'll consume you in the time that you have. Uh, if you wish to do so, fine, but this old guy's advice is don't do it. Electric propulsion. Now, get the lightest weight batteries. Electric has an opportunity here because the distance isn't too great and the time isn't too great. Having said that, you're going to have to do an enormously detailed propulsion trade to decide exactly what is going to propel this thing. I'm gonna be giving you an example later of an electric propulsion system simply because I wanted to pick one. Autonomy is gonna be very important. Essentially, I, I note here to reduce pilot workload, it may even have to play a role in safety if we're going to really move eventually in a direction of a commuter pilot. Um, do affordable simulation, very important. It's around, it's affordable. Please do it, you're gonna to have to do it. And of course, there's a whole lot of commercially available stability and control hardware. Think about getting it. Use additive manufacturing where you can. Um, it's becoming quite affordable. You may be able to make use of it. And if you're clever in your design and have a distributed propulsion system, you may in fact be able to multiply the effects of that propulsion system by getting aerodynamic effects on, let's say, some form of wing. These are some of the considerations that I sat down and thought about. Uh, there's a huge trade between hover efficiency and cruise efficiency, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. Um, speed. Don't get too clever here in trying to get too fast because you're going to pay a lot of energy for that. And if you look at the shape of the scoring curves, and by the way, I didn't mention that, they're not all linear. Some of them are extremely nonlinear. For example, speed. So I see little gain over 100 knots. In fact, for the example that I picked, I literally, and I didn't go through the optimization, which I should have, uh, I simply picked 60 knots. Um, now we get to this multivariable optimization. If you haven't developed a multivariable optimization model, do so. Believe me, do so. And we're gonna talk about what those variables are you, it's essential to optimize for this mission. Uh, in fact, I would suggest that it's one of the very first things that your team should have done. You should have created an optimum vision in aerodynamics and energy management. 
energy management becomes essential. Um, you want to stress a decent uh, hover power loading. Uh, just to remind everybody, that's the pounds of thrust per unit horsepower. I like using the term hover power loading as opposed to figure of merit because hover power loading includes the disc loading. Um, hover energy consumption, extremely important. Cruise energy consumption, extremely important. And also uh, allowing some energy for transition and, and, uh, uh, and uh, basically for some modicum of contingency. Now let's say you do all this. Let's say you go through it, you're convinced you, you're going to make it through your optimization. I want you to start thinking about what distinguishes your project. In the end, you, if you meet all the thresholds, thresholds, I would suggest that having the safest and easiest to use product may help you on your path to eventual success. Some useful parameters that ought to go into your, uh, into your uh, optimization models. And if they're not there, they should be there. Hover efficiency. Uh, and, and what is hover efficiency, really? It's the uh, pounds of payload times the time that you can carry that payload divided by the pounds of fuel. So we call it pound hours of payload divided by the pounds of fuel. Now, cruise efficiency is a bit different. It's the pound miles of payload divided by fuel. And um, I'm not gonna read this. You can see that cruise efficiency is a function of propulsive efficiency, L over D, et cetera. Empty weight fraction, useful weight fraction, payload weight fraction. To succeed in this competition, you're going to have an extreme have to develop an extraordinary empty weight fraction. And you'll see that by some of the examples later. L over D, um, a very confining problem when an eight and a half foot diameter, and remember, you can't add uh, transitional geometry in a sense that the geometry can't be useful in getting that additional lift. You couldn't fold the wings, for example, under the rules. Repulsive efficiency at cruise, very important. And I'm gonna talk about that. Vehicle cruise speed, don't get too greedy. I'll say it again. Stay within the reasonableness of the curve and make sure that that curve is built into your optimization program. SFC, this is very important. Try to get as good an SFC as you can, as low a number as you can. And it even applies to uh, electrics and in a sense that the fuel energy density plays a similar role. Now, today's batteries have a fuel energy density of about 250 watt hours per kilogram. Now NASA you know, has talked about getting up towards 500 um, in, in, in the years to come. I would doubt that you'll do much better than 250 watt hours per kilogram. I did go looking. Um, and I didn't find much. Uh, it could very well be it's out there, but I think that's a rational limit that you might want to consider. But remember, kerosene or jet fuel has got a lot more energy, but there are other elements of that propulsion system, uh, including the propulsion system itself, the engine, the installations, uh, perhaps the gearing, that uh, would have to be considered uh, so not everything is in the, in the fuel energy density. You have to think of the entire integrated propulsion system effect. This, this chart shows you uh, what I mean by design optimization. It depends very heavily on the aircraft mission. Um, and it's a chart I've used with, with, in many talks. You, on the ordinate, you have something called the cruise productivity. And on the abscissa, you have something called the hover productivity. And the cruise productivity or is really uh, what I talked about. I've sort, of into, into, uh, I've, I've sort of used the term cruise efficiency and productivity uh, interchangeably. It's, it's really how many uh, pound miles 
per pound of fuel, and the hover productivity is how many pound hours per pound of fuel, those pounds being payloads. So if you had a very high cruise productivity and a very low hover productivity, well, you'd want to have a fixed wing, turboprop, or some sort of airplane. Um, if you want to have superb hover productivity, but not so good cruise productivity, you want a helicopter. Now, this has been something that many designers have used through the years to think about how do you get a combination? And you can see people have been looking at various combinations of tilt rotors and X2s or ABCs uh, through the years. Uh, um, so where is the sweet spot for our Goal Fly mission? Well, that's what you've got to figure out in your optimization. But it might be useful to develop it, the concept, thinking about these relative trades between cruise and hover productivity. I want to go back to a chart that uh, many people have seen through the years. Dan Newman has this chart memorized, I can tell you. This is a chart that we call, well, it's, it's really a, a chart that describes the failures that we have had in our industry in trying to develop a high-speed VTOL design. Now, there are many, many concepts that have been tried through the years, and I've tried a few also, uh, including X-Wing, which would have gone uh, perhaps close to the speed of sound. Um, the only two that have come out of this uh, are the tilt rotor and perhaps Sikorsky's ABC or X2 concept. Not much else has come out of it. And you could argue the only really, at the, up to this point, successful one that's come out of it is the tilt rotor. Now, I show you this because we may end up, before we're done, in this brave new world of commercial uh, commuter pilotage, developing a very similar chart. This is an extraordinarily challenging business, and it requires a great deal of thought. So concentrate on our mission and optimize it. I'm talk about propulsion efficiency. Now, the way I've used it, I've sort of interchanged the propeller or propulsor or prop rotor with the gearbox efficiencies. So here you see a propeller efficiency uh, and you see it plotted as a, this is an old uh, con uh, compilation of NACA and NASA work, Royal Aeronautical work, and it shows you the effects on helical tip Mach number, and that's one of the reasons I was suggesting that if you decide on a very higher speed solution, you may want to reduce the uh, rotational speed of your propulsor. Um, but in any case, uh, yeah, there are occasions where we've gotten better than 0.9. Um, and most of the time today, you can achieve a propeller in the 0 0.85, 0 0.87 uh, area. I'm going to suggest for your studies, you use an overall number of about 0.8. And I'm suggesting that simply because you may have gearbox losses and motor losses and things of that sort that come into, come into the game here. I have some special suggestions uh, that I, I think is, in my mind, the key chart of my entire presentation here. Start with a realistic but capable parametric model. We talk about that. A great care. I mean, I cannot stress this enough in projecting your empty weight. Do not kid yourself. Don't start initially with CFD. Don't start initially with it. In fact, I suggest you use momentum theory and possibly blade element theory, and, and that's it to start with. Refine with CFD. Use it. Of course, you're going to need it. This is particularly true of an integrated propulsion schema, let's say like a ducted rotor. And remember, for ducted propulsion, and you can derive this from the momentum equation, about half the thrust comes from the inlet and body and the other half from, uh, from the propulsor itself. Use realistic propulsion efficiencies. We talked about it. Carefully predict the noise. The noise is worth a lot. And one way to do that is to start with somewhat lower tip speeds than you normally would have started with. Try to favor noise. 
Um, if you're doing a ducted rotor, don't kid yourself. Don't put a little ring around it and think you have a ducted rotor. It won't work that way. It'll actually be nothing more than a ring propeller. You really need to build a duct of some depth in order to get the full advantages of a ducted system. This is extremely important in optimizing if you have a duct in a wing and you're looking for a reasonable level of uh, thickness to cord ratio. Add some weight contingency. By the way, I didn't do any, any of these things uh, in the very simple model I'm gonna give you. I'm telling you to do what I didn't do. Uh, keep an empty weight contingency of about five to 8%. Now, if you have a high disc loading device, and by that I don't mean a helicopter. Let me give you an example. Like a helicopter today, order of magnitude of a disc loading of 10. A, uh, a tilt rotor, order of magnitude of 20, 25. Um, a ducted rotor, uh, an F-35, for example, has a disc loading of about 300. Now, it's been my experience that when you get disc loadings of 80 to 100, you don't get a gain in ground effect. In fact, it can be a loss. So be careful. Run your CFD. It very much depends on uh, the impact of IGE is not always positive as it is in a helicopter. It may, in fact, work the other way. So add some power energy for maneuver in the near-Earth environment. 5% uh, would be an absolute minimum. And especially if you have a ducted system, don't assume don't assume that the uh, power required looks like a helicopter curve. It may not. In fact, at 10 or 15 knots, you may find yourself with more power required than in hover. This can absolutely happen. And take great care in the pitch attitude of that, of that machine. You may not have balanced pitch on your ducted rotors. Once again, don't overplay the speed variable. I'm going to talk a little bit about electric propulsion. It's kind of in favor these days. People have been looking at it. Uh, AHS has whole activities going on on EV, EVTOL. And uh, I've spent my, most of my life with the Brayton cycle, which is gas turbines. Uh, but you may find a reasonable ignition uh, combustion engine or a reasonable diesel engine in this size range. I would caution you about any of these engines, and I would caution you about acoustics. Acoustics plays a big role in winning this prize. And I'll show you a design that didn't spend much time in acoustics and may have paid the price. Um, select a realistically available battery. Again, we talked about this before, 200 to 250 watt hours per kilogram. That's about it. I give you an example here of something I did find, uh, this particular Samsung cell, uh, which has uh, what's called a 10C high discharge rating. Uh, and it can run about, uh, batteries are rated uh, 16C or about 40 amps maximum. I'll explain these C ratings on the next chart. They really relate to how much time you can operate at max current. Um, and want to remind you, max current is usually during the hover mode. So I picked some numbers here. I'm not going to read them all. Uh, the battery uh, 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 density uh, that I suggest is, is given here. The motor, uh, uh, basically, uh, I think you can probably achieve motors of about 10 kilowatts per kilogram at about a 95% efficiency rating. Um, for our machines, you may not have inverters or rectifiers. Uh, you probably wouldn't, wouldn't go through all that, but uh, they're there. Uh, cables, don't forget about the weight of your cables. And most of all, don't forget about the thermal environments that go with any of these propulsion systems. The C rating, sometimes people ask me, what is it? Well, a 16 C rating says that you can run uh, 3.75 uh, minutes, uh, basically uh, at the full discharge, uh, 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 it defines the full discharge period, and you can run basically at max current at that point. 
So in setting your C rating, you really want to look at how much power you're going to need in hover. Um, and uh, so add the space weight and cooling for, uh, well, for batteries. And don't forget about momentum drag if, in fact, you're attempting to cool these electrical systems. When you're all done, and you've got your parametric model work through, start looking at what other people have claimed. Now, some of it is real, some of it's claims. I've picked a few of them. Um, this is the A3 Vahana. Uh, I want you to run your model against these people's claims, just so that you have an understanding of how well you've done with your model versus someone else's claims. And indeed, if they've actually flown, uh, that gives you something even better to compare your model with. I, I picked a model for my own work. Um, and, uh, and my work, of course, is very superficial compared to what you guys have to do. Um, I, I started with something called a NASA Puffin. Now, this aircraft was created by a guy who's extremely well known in our industry, Mark Moore, who's now with Uber. Um, this is when he was at NASA in 2010. Now, some of these numbers are from published data, and some I've derived. Um, it's a 600-pound machine, an empty weight of 300, a battery weight of 100, a payload of 200. Um, not that far from some of our requirements, the battery weight, the payload, of course, is, is right on. Um, he, he needed 60 horsepower, so uh, I came up with a power loading of, of 10. And that implies a disc loading of about 9 using a very optimistic figure of merit of 0.8. Um, that results in a rotor diameter, or two rotors, 6.5 feet in diameter. Uh, and the other sizes are given here. This thing had some decent speed because it came over uh, and its range uh, would have been about 50 miles. This aircraft does not meet, does not meet the stringent go fly requirement. It certainly is far too big in size. So I said, well, let me start with this thing and can I downsize it? What can I do with it? So what I did is I, I divined an aircraft. My aircraft has a gross weight of 575 pounds. Basically, I said if Mark could do it in 300, I'm going to make my aircraft a little smaller. I can do it at 275 pounds. I still have a human payload at 200 pounds, and I'm going to keep the battery weight at 100. I'm going to use a battery density of 250. I'm going to, I'm going to divide a two-minute hover uh, that probably shouldn't say loiter. It ought to say touch and go uh, kind of time. And for my purposes, I've simply decided to hover uh, in this 30-foot area uh, or near hover. So I have a very simple energy calculation that I've developed that just divides the mission into two sections, a, an equivalent hovering section and an equivalent cruise section. Um, I presumed a, a, a propulsion efficiency of 0.8. And I, and I thought a lot about what L over D would be, and I decided that about eight, about six, six and a half, I would have liked to have made it better, but I, I had to really shorten the wings. Um, and, uh, and this is what I came up with. Two 4.25 foot prop rotors. Now, that's aggressive. In fact, it may be wrong because I've taken up the whole eight and a half foot uh, that's allotted to us. But I wanted to see how far I could go if I did that. So I ended up with a disc loading of about 20. Now notice that's pretty high. You know, that's pretty high. It's basically tilt rotor level uh, disc loading. And let's compare it with the previous puffing characteristics. Had a power loading of 10, a disc loading of nine. So I decided to scale the performance. Well, we know that hover power loading is proportional to the one over the square root of the disc loading. And I end up with a power loading of about 6.6. .6. Don't worry about the, all the other decimal places. They probably don't mean a darn thing. Uh, and in some sense, I'm sorry I pruned them this way. But in any case, let's say you got 6.6 .6 pounds per horsepower. 
So I end up with a Hubbard power of about 64.7 kilowatts. Not insignificant, that's what, 88, something like that horsepower. And I said I was going to hover equivalent for two minutes. So that says I will consume 2.15 kilowatt hours. How much energy do we have? Well, we said we were going to, we were going to have 100 pounds, and we were going to, uh, 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 so what can 100 pounds give us? Well, 100 pounds gives us uh, 11.364 kilowatt hours. That's it. That's all I've got to power this aircraft, 11.36 kilowatt hours. Now, what's my cruise energy available? Well, it's the total minus what I consumed in hover, uh, about nine. And I've got a cruise power, and I'll show you how I get it uh, on the side there by simply multiplying the thrust times the velocity uh, divided by the propulsive efficiency. And I get a cruise power of 20.4. Uh, and that gives me, since I had 9.2 kilowatt hours available, about 27 minutes of cruise time. And what does that mean? Let's summarize all this. We talked about almost everything on top already. Uh, so if I were to fly a very tight course, let's say it was a five to one ellipse around the course, I would have, and I did it at 60 knots, I would have, an, and this, if you remember, is described in a little bit more detail on the previous slide. I have an equivalent go fly speed of 56.6 knots. And I only took 6.38 minutes to fly the course. Now, with less maneuverability, less turnability, um, if I flew that course, say, say, in a three to one ellipse, I'd have a speed penalty. So you have to be careful here. But that speed penalty would then go to 47. Um, so what's the overall results? The hover power, 65. The cruise power, a little over 20. Mission energy consumed about 8.2. That gives us a reserve energy of three. Wow. Unfortunately, the rules state that the reserve energy has got to be greater than what I consumed, which was 8.28 kilowatt hours, divided by two which is 4.1. So I don't make it. I really need a little over four kilowatt hours to do this thing. And, I, and my design only gets you to, to three. But it did get you to 20 minutes. Now notice I, uh, I simply st uh, kept on cruising because I defined uh, VBE at 60 knots also. And that's why the cruise energy is consumed for 18 minutes. Uh, and the uh, hover, of course, for two minutes. So when I'm all done, the distance flown is about 18 nautical miles, so I don't quite even make the goal of 20 nautical miles, which wasn't a requirement. So the, places I, the place I really fall down here is in not making the reserve energy. This is extremely important. Let's talk about some other design you might use as a, as a comparison. Um, one, one, one design you might use as a comparison uh, would be the Sikorsky Cipher. This happens to be one of my designs. Um, and, and it worked beautifully. We flew it for over 400 hours, 400 landings and takeoffs. Unfortunately, Sikorsky decided not to exploit this after I retired. I have my own thoughts about that, by the way. Um, and it was fly-by-wire. It is not a ducted fan. It is a ducted rotor with full collective and full cyclic. It is a bearingless, counter-rotating ducted rotor, which means we can move that center of thrust anywhere. The aircraft was rock steady, fly-by-wire, and in fact, its flight control system became some of the basis for Sikorsky's eventual X-2 success. Um, this aircraft didn't have much maximum speed because remember, you have to tilt over the whole, the whole aircraft. It's a pure UAV. And um, it, we eventually came up with wing versions that got to much higher speeds. Now, the main part of the chart here is the power plant. This 50 horsepower engine was not a very big success, and I'll say why. It worked, it worked quite well, but it made a great deal of noise. 
And I can tell you when I showed it to the chairman of the board, he wasn't too happy about the, the acoustics. And I said, well, it cost 5,000 bucks and we were able to get it in an expeditious way. He said, yeah, but it's just too noisy. So here we had a great aircraft, flew beautifully, but because we spent very little time with the acoustics, uh, we paid the price. The aircraft never went into production, even though it was an enormously successful development aircraft. Perhaps you can learn from this experience. So I said, think about the Bahana. Here are some of the characteristics that the Bahana has published. I'm not gonna read these. You, you'll be able to get these by accessing uh, my, my presentation uh, from the GoFly people. Uh, but some of this is all available online. Uh, nothing here is uh, created by me. It really is totally available online. And, and of course, I also picked the Velocicopter uh, as something you also may want to uh, compare. Two different versions of the Velocicopter. I want to conclude my talk by um, so asking you to consider where you're going with your design. Let's assume that you have a vision for your design uh, to make it a, a precursor for a true pilot commuter kind of aircraft. Human concerns and human safety concerns, as we've talked about earlier, are enormous. They're not only for the pilot commuter, but for the folks on the ground. Developing emergency procedures, pilot training, certification, regulation, and insurance costs are going to be extremely important. And they may not come cheap. They may not come cheap, uh, at least in the beginning. And then, of course, adverse weather. How do you do that? And what rules do you follow? Making these technologies consumer-friendly or as human error-proof as possible, as I said, may come at a pretty decent cost. And certainly the average commuter is not necessarily going to afford these original, let's call them 50, 100,000 aircraft that, that get built. Um, they may become a bit more expensive. So don't presume that you're gonna sell 2 million aircraft when you do your, your trade study. Uh, be careful. Um, inspections and airworthiness checks. Now, you're gonna say, well, what do, you, what do you mean? Yeah, you gotta think about what Chris Van Buten said. We've gotta do 10 times better than an S92 in order, not, in order to be publicly accepted. We'd have too many events that just wouldn't work. Um, so what are you gonna do? We've got to make sure that this becomes nearly as error-proof and possibly autonomously checked as possible because you can't assume that the consumer is going to necessarily be able to do that. Will he necessarily perform all the pre-flight inspections? Possibly when and cars were young in 1908, people were uh, not only the motorists, they were mechanics. They understood every aspect of their vehicle. Today, we go in and we push the start button. All the automatic features of our systems are pre-checked. Our, our, our concept here is in its infancy. We have to think about how we can use autonomy cleverly to help us make this craft human era proof. Please think about that. Finally, power supplies and safe battery usage. Um, it's likely you're gonna end up with a lithium polymer battery of some kind. Um, think about the, uh, uh, the, the charge, the discharge uh, practices. Think about the safety practices. Think about the temperature effects. Um, that pretty well concludes my formal comments. Finally, I have one wonderful bit of advice for you. Have some fun learn a lot, and go fly. So at this moment, I'm open for discussion, and I'll ask Paul to provide those topics as he sees fit. Thank you. Great. 
thank you very much. We got some uh, some questions for us to go through. Uh, and if you have any other questions, if you're uh, listening, feel free to type those into the Q&A or the chat and we'll work through as many as we can. Um, so at the beginning, you uh, talked a little bit about um, uh, you know, inventing new engines and cautioned against trying to do that. Uh, do you think uh, engines are, are riskier than other technologies that might be incorporated into the, the design? I do. Um, historically, um, development of an engine can take two to five years, really to get, it, get the whole system wrung out. Let's say you were trying to develop a new kind of diesel, or opposing piston diesel, or a new kind of Wonko, or something of that sort. To ring it out, in my experience on many, many engines, um, it takes a while. I'll give you an example of what the government has done. In the development of the Black Hawk and the Apache, the engines were developed several years before the aircraft. Now, today, before we go to the future of vertical lift, the Army is developing its improved turbine engine concept engine. That will be... Uh, one of, the, one of the engines considered for, for a future vertical lift. In almost all these cases, the engines are developed before the aircraft. Please try to avoid that. It can become a complex and extremely costly decision. In fact, it can destroy your whole concept. You might, for example, find that you have slightly better fuel consumption with engine A over engine B, or very slightly better power to weight ratio. Don't assume that engine's gonna be available. These are my thoughts. You have enough to do. Think about the, the optimization that I talked about. Think about finding that sweet spot on speed, that sweet spot on size, and that sweet spot on, very important, on acoustics. Great. Thanks. Uh, so wings are valuable uh, for forward flight, but a weight penalty uh, and likely a download penalty in hover. How do you decide whether a wing is a net benefit or not? Well, again, exactly the method that I talked about. Okay. Let's say that you, um, with a wing, let's say you got an L over D of, uh, equivalent L over D of about uh, seven, eight, whatever. And uh, in, in order to do that, uh, you may have paid a penalty and hover. Well, the issue really is to trade those two using the optimization trade that I talked about. Now, let's say the wing is hurting, is hurting you and hover but you're not in hover very long. For example, I postulated that we would be in this low speed equivalent hover uh, mode in my little model for two minutes. Well, maybe we can do it in a minute and a half. Maybe we can even, because remember, the GoFly team doesn't prescribe the mission. So you have to simulate and decide if I could do it in a minute and a half or even less, well, then I might be able to take a little bit more hover penalty and then have a little bit better lift to drag ratio out, out as a, in my, in my, uh, in my uh, cruise and loiter period. So it's all about man managing the energy consumption uh, throughout the mission. Now I picked in my simple model, two basic zones of, of energy consumption, hover and cruise loiter. Um, probably to do this job properly, you ought to have at least three or four, probably at least four, uh, and then decide whether the wing is worth it or not worth it. Um, the wing may, may actually be worth it here because if you can keep your hover time down, you may actually do pretty well. So having a decent L over D, I think is important in this mission. Great, thanks. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on the, uh, the duck depth as it pertains to being uh, enough to produce a true duck augmentation? Well, I can, but I'm gonna be very careful in my answer. Um, I would tell you that if you think that you've got a five foot diameter, let's pick a five foot diameter duck, 
and you think you're going to get it and you're going to have a duck depth of half an inch, uh, excuse me, half a foot, it isn't enough. You're going to need something that's perhaps not a diameter, but um, perhaps in the order of, uh, if I had a guess, about half a diameter. Now, maybe at the lowest I could think about would be about a third of a diameter. But you really need to run that because if you don't, you're going to end up with nothing but a ring propeller and you will not get the augmentation. If you go through the augmentation, let's say in static thrust of a duct, it's worth 27%. You can derive that from the equ uh, momentum equations. Um, in order to get that, you really have to have the flow a time to really fill the duct, otherwise it will contract as it does in a classic propeller. Um, and and that, will, that will result in, in, a, in, in far less thrust per unit horsepower. So I gave you a guess, but I will tell you that the best way to go about it is to run some CFD on that duct. That you should do. But don't start out with a little teeny ring. Start out with a little bit more duct. And then be careful because if you make the duct and put the duct in the wings, let's say, you may end up with too high a thickness to cord ratio, which could affect your lift to drag significantly. Great. Uh, and then why did you use disc loading uh, instead of blade loading? Well, one, I didn't have blades, did I? All I had was a momentum disc, which I applied a, uh, a, a, uh, an overall efficiency number on. Uh, so when I, the disc loading was a very convenient way for me to ratio from what, uh, what uh, Mark Moore had done in great detail. So all I did is say if Mark Moore had a disc this big, in his case, two, two uh, I don't know, six and a half, whatever they were, foot diameter discs, and my disc diameters were different. And I said, whatever efficiency Mark Moore had worked in, in my model, I presume that I could get the same efficiencies. And I then made my, uh, uh, my sums, assuming that the power loading is proportional, which is well known, to one over the square of the disc loading. So it was a very simple way for me to get a very quick two-page calculation done. Great. Now, I'm not suggesting that you shouldn't use blade element theory. In fact, I ask you to use blade element theory before you use CFD. Uh, at the beginning, you, you talked a, a bit about the, the great importance of uh, safety. Uh, can you expand a little bit on any thoughts you might have about uh, making sure the operator is protected from any sort of uh, failures, especially that might happen in like the propeller or, or rotor desk areas? These are difficult questions to answer. They can only really be done in detail. Um, I can tell you that there are elements of your design which will have to go single string in a sense from the reliability point of view. Um, for example, if, if a helicopter loses its main rotor uh, shaft, well, that's a serious, serious problem. <laughs> so rotor goes off into space. Um, uh, so I'm simply going to ask you to think about if a control cable, how, how do you prevent a control cable from jamming? How do, you, how do you make sure that if you have some sort of centering spring or something like that in your flight control that would go to some neutral conditions should something fail? Try to take every system you can and failure-proof it up to the point where you're in your primary uh, structure. Um, there's no simple way to answer this question except by detailed review. Carry out a series of peer reviews. In other words, with your team, carry out a series of reviews. With your mentors, carry out a series of reviews. Go over every system, every system, and think about how you can failure-proof it. And when we're all done, think about how you can put a modicum of autonomy in it. If you're going to have an onboard computer, 
can you sense a particular failure has occurred and then move your control system to some stable condition? Um, I'm, I'm only asking you to use autonomy uh, as an assist to the pilot here. Of course, you do have the option, I believe, uh, and help me with this, Paul, uh, to use, uh, to not actually have a human. You can, in fact, put a load in here equivalent to a human and then fly it, or at least that's the way Sky explained it to me. So, um, whichever way you do it, think about what can fail and think about how you can instantiate systems to preclude that event. Great. Um, can you talk a little bit about how designs might interact with the ground? Uh, things like landing gears or brackets or skids and uh, things to think about in terms of the amount of size they take up and the you know, very uh, size restrictive uh, elements of design? Well, um, let's take my cipher design. Um, there you had, okay, this is one area that I did talk about, if, if you think about it, uh, in ground effect. Where you put the gear is very important as to how, whether or not you have a negative effect uh, in ground effect. You have too low a gear, you may have a tendency for the entire craft to suck down in a high disc loading solution therefore requiring more power than you would, let's say, in a lower disc loading helicopter. So the answer is it depends uh, to a great deal on the location of your, of your wings and the disc loading of your propulsor. Having said this, a skid might very well work in way less than a uh, landing gear. You're not required to roll this machine. Now, if we were truly putting it in, in, in uh, John, uh, John Q. Public's garage, we probably would need to roll it. But if you can simply put your aircraft down into the zone, I would think that a fixed element of uh, skid um, or ring uh, would work uh, quite well. Um, uh, now, what, what should that weigh? Well, um, you have to think about a, a modicum of crashworthiness. The FAA's requirement is about, you have to be able to withstand an impact at about 10 feet per second. Uh, military requirements are much higher than that. So think about whether or not, you know, I would try to design with the FAA requirement and try to think about the structure that you might design that would absorb energy up to an impact of 10, 15 feet a second, um, and then build some sort of possibly um, uh, energy absorbing composite into the structure. Um, and I think that would give you a reasonably lighter weight solution. I'm not sure I'm helping with these thoughts, but they're things I would go to. <laughs> Great, very much appreciated. Uh, I think just time for one last question. Uh, if you could leave us with any final uh, parting words for the competitors or any last pieces of advice that you have for them. I think you have an opportunity that few people have. Uh, and I think the GoFly team and Boeing in particular have created and facilitated this, this, this opportunity. This is a great opportunity for you to work together as a team to learn, to balance aerodynamics, mechanics, flight control, everything, with an eventual, an eventual commercial application. Uh, as I say, we're at the beginning of this brave new world of, of commuter aviator. And I think you guys have the opportunity uh, to be at a point in time where Igor Sikorsky was in 1939. And I can only suggest to you that you have a wonderful opportunity to follow uh, in his legacy. I wish you all the best. Great. Thanks so much. And just for a few parting words, I'll pass it back over to Gwen. Ken, thank you so very much for that wonderful, informative master lecture. We truly appreciate it. 
as all of our innovators know, this is a wonderful opportunity and the opportunities for you to design in the manner and the shape uh, that you see fit uh, within our GoFly parameters. So we wish you all the best of luck. We are so very thankful to you, Ken, and uh, we look forward to seeing you all again at our next master lecture. So thank you all, have a great day.